Okay, uh, we're going to go through um, what to do with your headless system running on the chip computer, the $9 computer. I just flashed it with the headless system, but everything we do here will also work on a system, the chip system that you've installed a GUI interface for. But uh, this is something you'll do definitely, or most likely, if you have a headless system. Uh, so basically what we're doing is, you can make a headless system, you could hook it up to a TV or a screen and hook a keyboard and mouse to it, but if you're running as a server, you may not have a screen or anything for it, so you're going to have to log in and set it up somehow. So, just finish flashing it. So the next thing we're going to do is you can actually connect to the chip computer through a serial connection, uh, which is most likely is going to be under your dev folder, TTY, capital ACM0 on most Linux systems, unless you have other serial devices hooked up uh, that it will be recognizing that you might get a different number. But just to check, we can go uh, D message, a DM ESG, and that will display recent messages, logs, and we're going to grab for TTY. So here we go, and you can see right here, I just plugged it in, so you can see right here, this is the one that's showing up. I'll clear the screen. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to use a program, and there's other programs you use, but Screen, which you'll have to install, um, Screen, and then point to, towards Dev, TTY, ACM0, or whatever you saw in that D message. Uh, now, I'm going to hit enter, and you can see uh, that I get my screen terminal. Let me try running it again. You might have this issue where you can't access it, and this may be due to permissions. Uh, so you can add yourself to the, mo or to the serial group, by using this command. Let me clear the screen here, paste this in here. So you're going to do sudo uh, user mod dash a g. So you're adding a user to a group, dial out group, and then dollar sign user will just use the current user, or you can manually type out the username. Doing that though, you're going to have to log out and log back in. Uh, there might be a way to do it without logging out and logging back in, uh, but normally that's what I do. You don't have to restart your whole system, just log out and log back in, and you'll be added to that group. If you don't want to log out and log back in, you can change the permissions of the TTY ACM0. Although, if you change it, you'll have to change it every time you unplug or plug in the computer. Or you can just do sudo screen dev TTY ACM0. So you're saying sudo, and you'll have to type in your username, or sorry, your password. Now, once you're connected, you may see a login prompt, you may not. If you don't, hit enter a couple of times and it should show up. Now, occasionally going through a USB port like this, I find that the text gets kind of messed up where things are supposed to go to new lines and they don't, uh, which is kind of a pain in the butt. And the simplest solution I have for that is restart the chip computer. Uh, but your password, default password is going to be, or username is going to be chip, and the default password is going to be chip. So the first thing we want to do, of course, is change that. So you're going to use the pass wd command to change it. So type that, we'll hit enter, it's going to ask you to type in your current password, which is chip, and then we'll ask you to type in a new password twice. Now if your password is too short, for example if I type in tux twice, it's going to tell me your password needs to be longer. So I'm just going to put in a longer password here and type it a second time. And it says your password was successfully updated. So now I'm going to type in exit, and it will log me out. And then I'm going to log in again with chip. And I'm just doing this to check my password, make sure that it actually took. So log in, username, chip, and your new password. So let's say theoretically you want a shorter password than it's allowing. Uh, you can do that. It's not recommended on a real system, but maybe you're just using this chip as a test system, and so you're going to put a short password because you don't want to type a long password each time. Whatever your reason, you can do that. Uh, you can type in sudo pw, or sorry, pass wd, and then be sure to give it the username. If you don't put the username here, you're going to be changing your root password, which you can also do. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter here. And now it's asking, just because I'm running the sudo command, to put in my password, so I will. Now, when you're running a sudo or root, it won't ask you for your current password. Here, this was just part of the sudo command. But the actual 
pass w, uh, pass wd command is not going to ask for it, which is great as an administrator. You can change anyone's password at any time without knowing the password because as an administrator, you shouldn't know your user's passwords. You're still administrator of a machine. You're still root of the machine, but that doesn't mean you should know someone's password. Anyway, now I can put in a shorter password such as tux. I'll type it twice and we updated it to tux. So as sudo or root, you can put whatever password you want, short or long, and it's going to accept it. And again, if I was to run that same command, but leave out chip, at this point, I'm changing it for the root user. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, you don't want to forget to type it. So if you're not using the sudo command, you don't have to put the username because it's using your current user. But if you do sudo, it thinks you're root, and it's going to change the root password. So I'm going to go ahead and change the root password to tux, tux, just for this test system. Normally, that would be a bad idea because tux is going to be <laughs> in a password list. And if someone's trying to brute force your system, they're going to get in. But this is just the test system here. OK, so that's the first thing we did. So we're on, the, on our system now, again, through USB. Let's connect to a network. So the first thing we want to do is, well, Chip has a built-in program. You're going to want to be sudo to run it. Uh, so we're going to do sudo nmtui. And when you hit enter, you get this text-based GUI, if that makes any sense. And we'll go down to acti uh, activate a connection. Find your wireless connection here. Mine's Castle. I'll hit enter, and I will type in my super secret um, passphrase for my uh, uh, web key. Go ahead and hit enter. Oh, not web key. WPA. I'm running WPA, not web. <laughs> OK, so quit. And now I can do sudo, let's sudo ifconfig, and you can see that I am on the local network. Now at this point, I can continue using the serial uh, interface here through USB. Like I said, sometimes that gets kind of messed up and, the, and not everything gets displayed to the screen. If it's working fine, it's working fine. If not, I can exit out of this or I can even leave that open and open up a new shell. So the top shell here top screen is still through USB. The bottom screen here, make that a little bit bigger, the chip automatically has SSH server running on it. So I can SSH username chip, because that's the name on the chip computer, and the IP address I want to connect to. And I'll hit enter. And now I've done this before in the system, but I flash it since then. So if you've reflashed your machine, uh, your chip machine, you're going to want to run this command to clear out that, that key. It tells you right there, remove it with this. And that's to prevent man in the middle attacks, someone trying to pretend the server is that they're the server and grabbing your password. Now, if you haven't done it before, when you run this command, it's going to ask you, are you sure you want to accept this key? And you're going to have to type yes. Why won't work? You have to actually type out the words yes. And it's going to give you a key that later on it will check and make sure that you're connecting to the actual server, which is what the last thing was doing because it had changed since the last time uh, I had flashed the machine. Well, I flashed the machine and it changed the key. So once you do that, it should only take a second here. My network connection from the chip isn't the best in here. I'll type in the password that we just changed the user to. And now I'm logging in through the network. And then you should be logged in. I had to, it disconnected, I had to reconnect there. Uh, I cut the video because it was just taking long. Uh, even though I'm just in the room next to my router, I find that this chip computer, the network, I don't know, I've only had it for a couple days, suddenly doesn't seem like the best Wi-Fi. I don't know if it's the Wi-Fi chip or just the system running slow. It's only a $9 computer. You can't expect too much out of it. Um, sometimes I find that it works great and other times not so much. So like in this case, it was taking forever to connect and then it, it broke and I had to re-log in. Um, so yeah, you can log in through USB, this through serial USB up here, or you can go through SSH once you've connected to the network. Which one's better? Uh, they both have their pros and cons. Um, again, the serial works great. It's a wired connection, but sometimes the screen gets garbled up. Haven't had that issue during this video, but it has happened. And the wireless through SSH, I do that all the time to other systems. As long as you have a reliable network connection, it's great. Um, today with the chip computer, I'm not, I wasn't having too much luck there. So, um, I mean, it's working fine. Let's, let's just see list. So yeah, it's still, yeah, working great now. So anyway, 
the last thing you probably want to do before you start using the system is update everything. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Linux systems, uh, and if you are, you already know this, so you can skip this part of the video. Uh, but this is a Debian-based system. Uh, most Linux distributions have what's called a package manager. Um, so, yep, yep, see now this, the, the shell here through the network isn't working that great. I'm, I'm losing the connection or something. So let me log in back up here, make this full screen. So, still connected to the network. Let's see if I can ping Google. Yeah, so it's just the wireless connection. Uh, I don't know, maybe my router's having issues, but I'm thinking it's more the, the uh, chips since uh, my desktop computer doesn't seem to be having any problems. Again, a $9 computer, you can't expect too much, but I was really hoping that the, uh, the Wi-Fi would work a little better than this. There we go. Now we're connected back up. Okay. So if you can keep an internet connection <laughs> with, your, uh, with your chip, uh, what you can do now is you can... Um, you're going to want to update your system. So sudo apt-is already installed. I think apt-get is also installed. Uh, and you can do either apt or apt-get. Uh, so you can do update and then sudo apt-upgrade dash y. Type in your super secret password and hopefully it will start going here connecting to the internet and Again, the internet seems to have gone down on my chip. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So let me quickly explain this. As I was saying, most Linux distributions have what's called a package manager, or a software manager, some people call it, and it connects to what's called repositories. You, have, you should have default repositories that come with your operating system. In this case, it's a Debian-based operating system. It has Debian repositories, and it also has some chip repositories that the chip developers have put in there. And as long as you stick with the, de with the default repositories that it came with, you should be good to go. And unlike other operating systems where you go out on the internet or you go and buy a disk or whatever and you install software, this is one program that pulls it all down. Think of it as like an app store on your phone, only Linux has been doing this since the 90s. Um, and it's all free. Benefits of this, think of like a Windows machine you have a bunch of updaters running in the background constantly popping up saying this program needs to be updated, this program needs to be updated and they're all taking up processing power where here you have one program that takes care of that for you. This is a shell interface for it but there's also a GUI interface. If you install the chip uh, with a the desktop there's already an icon by your clock that's checking for updates. And the benefits of this again you don't have multiple updaters running you don't have the instances where you go into a program like your office application and you want to use it and it goes, oh, there's updates available, update now, and it bugs you when you're trying to use the program uh, because everything is updated through this one package manager and all the software should be checked for your system. You know it's secure. You know that it's not malicious or theoretically it shouldn't be malicious. And just, you know, every so often, I suggest at least once a week, but at minimum once a month, running the command we just ran. We actually ran two commands. We ran update and upgrade. Update goes to the servers and gets a list of all the new packages available, all the new programs and libraries available. And then upgrade will upgrade any programs you currently have installed that need to be upgraded. And the dash Y I did at the end there was just to say yes to all, because otherwise it'll ask you, are you sure you want to upgrade? upgrade. Um, and yeah, now usually you know, on a desktop machine, it usually doesn't take long unless you have a lot of updates, which means you haven't done updates in a while, but if you just have a few, it should only take a minute or so. And that's updating everything, your web browser, your office applications, your drivers, your photo applications, everything, as long as you haven't installed anything outside of those default repositories. And again, this little talk here at the end is for people who aren't familiar with Linux. I'm assuming that there might be people out there who have bought chip computers that aren't familiar with Linux. Um, and again, there's lots of benefits of this. and. Uh, but there are people out there who try to install software outside of the default repositories, which very rarely is, is needed. Most of the time when people do that, it, they think they need to and they usually don't. They, they're insistent that they want something that, that, that's going to mess up their machine, basically. And the great thing about this is, is 
when you have a program, program, even a basic program, is probably going to have some libraries that it's dependent on. So these dependencies, uh, one, a package manager like this will see, oh, this program needs this library, and so does this one. They can share it rather than installing multiple copies, which some operating systems and some packaging uh, type applications do, so then you end up with multiple copies of libraries on your system. Um, and it also, if once you start installing software outside of the repositories, you might have dependency issues. So for example, you might install program X, and program X depends on program Y, but not just program Y, it might need program Y 4 or higher, and you might install a program from another website or add another repository that installs uh, program Y 3.9 and now your program X stops working because it was overwritten by program Y's wrong version and it gets kind of complicated. As long as you don't change the default repositories you don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, I hear people talk about Linux having uh, dependency issues uh, which I can tell you 10 years ago there, when I first started using Linux there was a little bit of that. I haven't had any dependency issues in years uh, but I still hear people having these problems and it's usually because they add extra repositories that are outside of the default and Debian has pretty much everything you're going to need. Uh, if you're going outside of those repositories, and I'm, again there are occasional exceptions, um, most of the time you don't need to. Anyway, that's just a little speech again for people who are new to Linux who might be using this chip computer explaining how this works. Don't install stuff outside of the default repositories <laughs> unless you really know what you're doing and you really trust where it's coming from. So again, thank you for watching this. I hope you found it useful and if you have any questions, go ahead and comment below. Uh, please visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. There should be a link in the description. And as always, I hope that you have a great day.